Well, first of all, thanks for the introduction for the organizers for setting up this nice meeting. I would also like to apologize up front because I had a commitment tomorrow long before this started, so which forces me to go back already tonight. But I will be here all day, so please catch me so we can talk as much as possible. And it looks like a great meeting. I wish I could be here for the whole thing. Um, so what I will do now is to give I'm not sure I'm, I'm following the instructions correctly, but hopefully it will be a useful tutorial anyway. Um, so I will start with a reasonably broad introduction to the basics of thermoelectrics and in this way motivating at least why one looks at quantum dot heat engines. I'm not sure I can promise. I'm not, I'm not attempting a full review of everything that has been done with quantum dots because I wasn't sure how to fit it. Um, but I will give a fairly tutorial introduction to the whole field, motivating why people are looking at these systems, at least from my perspective. And then we'll, in this sort of main part, come to two experiments. One where we, after many years, finally succeeded to actually realize a quantum dot heat engine with high efficiency. And then what I may be most excited about, that a fairly recent realization that this physics actually directly applies to hot carrier solar cells with actual maybe real applications. So I'm, and I'm telling you a bit about how far we have come in that direction. So this will be sort of two parts, I guess. Now, the first slide's at the risk that I bore you terribly, but I think it's still useful to set up a little bit of stage. And usually in thermoelectrics type conferences, everybody starts with these slides. In the first talk, I'm allowed to start with these slides, I guess. So um, thermoelectrics, one, one example that maybe convinces me most is that many of you who own a house will have some kind of heating arrangement in the house, unless you get distance heat, but in most houses still, I guess across the world at least, there's somewhere in the basement there's a little flame producing hot water. That flame, if it's a gas flame in particular, can be rather hot, um, even though what you want at the other end is not that hot. Um, you want maybe 60 degrees Celsius water circulating and what's coming out of the shower, hopefully not even that hot. That difference in temperature, so the way you supply your heat and we in, in the end actually want to use it, is a resource, as everybody understands who knows quantum dot heat engines. And thermoelectrics is the effect where you can take a conductor, um, keep one side hot, the other side cold, and get an electric current out of this. So with this notion, you could, even in your house, um, it would be totally fair game to use this temperature difference to, for example, produce electricity and still end up with at least almost the same amount of heat coming out the other end, a large part of it, which would be definitely a big gain. Um, and the, the way of doing this is to look at thermoelectric materials. And I mentioned before that you see this in principle in, in any conductor, that if you apply a temperature difference across a conductor, you will in generally, generally see a certain amount of voltage. This voltage is described by the Seebeck coefficient, in linear response at least, telling you if you have a certain delta T across a chunk of material that can be a micrometers or millimeters or anything, then you will see a certain amount of voltage. That voltage can of course drive a current against the load and that allows you to extract electricity. The amount of electricity that you can get out is described by the power factor, which where the Seebeck coefficient, so that's the voltage per temperature that you can generate, appears in the square because on the one hand, it, so it's, it's like the it's, um, power is V squared times R, times R I guess. Um, that means you, the, the voltage describes how much current you can get and the voltage also describes how much work every electron can do. So that's why it appears with the square. And then you don't have an R, people put the, or V squared over R, they put the conductivity here. So the higher the conductivity of the material, the more power you can get out. So what you want, this is the good guy. So this is what you want to get out of a thermoelectric material. The problem with thermoelectrics is that you also have a denominator here, meaning that any heat conductance of the material is a parasitic short circuit, meaning be it the electrons or the phonons, whoever carries heat from hot to cold does this without doing any good. So that's a pure heat loss meaning that the efficiency is related to this Z factor, which is called the figure of merit. Actually, the figure of merit is Z times the temperature, but I just put the Z here, saying it's how much power factor, how much power you can get out 
relative to the losses that you will incur just by heat flow that you don't really want. So an ideal thermoelectric material would have a high power factor and a very, very small thermal conductivity. And to sum things up very roughly, this is what thermoelectrics, the field of bulk thermoelectrics, by bulk I mean where you actually want to produce power out of a chunk of material, what kind of be, that could be a nano-based material, but still a you know, physical large piece of, chunk, piece of material. What one is battling, that it's really, really hard to get the power factor large while keeping the thermal conductivity small. In part, this is fundamental because of the Wiedemann-Franz law that sigma and kappa e, the thermal conductivity of the electrons, are actually related. If one is large, the other one is large. But also the phonons play a big role. The way to reduce phonon heat flow is to mess up the material in one way or another, and that generally also messes up the power factor. There's nothing fundamental about this. Nobody so far has found any fundamental reason why this thing shouldn't get big but it turns out to be just really, really hard. So what people want is a ZT above three or so. That would mean a efficiency of the, I think, 30% or so of Carnot efficiency. This would be a competitive material for many applications. The ones you can actually buy still, after many years of research, still hover around one. The world record is very hard to pin down because these records are not always reproducible, but this one seems to be solid for bulk materials around 2.6, but at very high temperature. So this is roughly where we are. And sort of in this broad introduction, just one more word about why people look at nanomaterials very broadly, actually. I've done this for more than 20 years now. There's basically two separate reasons. So everything can be explained with this figure of merit. So one thing is you want, in semiconductors in particular, semiconductors show the largest power factor. And in those materials, the electronic contribution to the thermal conductivity is generally small because the electronic relatively low amount of carriers relatively means a relatively low pot contribution to the thermal conductivity. So the phonons are usually the big contribution. So you want to kill phonon heat flow, and that works. People have done uh, many different ways of doing this, have established good understanding and good progress on sometimes massively reducing the phonon thermal conductivity in a nanomaterial compared to the corresponding bulk material. Roughly speaking, by messing up the material on a length scale of the phonon mean free path or less. So basically, if you in some way introduce interface scattering every phonon mean free path or less, you will reduce the phonon heat conductivity. And you can do this in a sort of a brute force way by grinding up your material into nanoparticles and squeezing them back together, or in a fancy way by making super lattices or even ran semi-random super lattices. So those are the world record. They are solid materials with a thermal conductivity less than air. So they do a very good job. And nanowire is another one where you just make a very thin material, introduce lots of phonon scattering at the surface. So this works very well. Unfortunately, not always by keeping, while keeping the power factor high, as you can imagine, since the conductivity shows up there. So this is one of the challenges. The other to reason, and this is the one that I will entirely focus on in the rest of the talk, the other reason to look at, the, at nanomaterials is that you can play with the, power, the ratio of the power factor over the electronic thermal conductivity by introducing some kind of, of um, very strongly varying density of states. And this is what I will explain in more detail now how this works. But you get a strongly varying density of states in, in low dimensional materials. So in principle by, mar and this is of course very, it's tantalizing since low dimensional effects and these effects over there seem to go very well hand in hand. So people have been fascinated by this. So it makes sense to look at this. It's just it's really challenging to make it to work. But this is what I will explain a little bit more in detail. So why, in particular, I will be talking about quantum dots, as you can imagine. Why is it that these resonances in the, in the density of states can give you a better performance in terms of the thermal conductivity, in, in terms of the power factor in particular, or power factor ratio over, over the ele thermal electronic conductivity? So I will refer to this ratio of the power produced divided by the electronic portion of the thermal conductivity, I will refer to as the electronic efficiency. So it means for the next 20 minutes or so, I will be totally fooling you and by pretending that there are no phonons. I will only talk about electronic efficiency. I get back to the phonons in the end. So 
maybe to, to say this already now, the reason why I am excited about hot carrier solar cells is in a hot carrier solar cell one tries to extract energy from the non-equilibrium carriers which are not in thermal equilibrium with the lattice. And in that case you actually don't have the phonons as a heat leak. So all, everything that I will sort of be cheating now by saying I'm ignoring the phonons does actually apply directly to hot carrier solar cells. So this is why I'm excited about this. So I'll get back to this in the end. Hopefully this will become clear. And just to also say who sort of started maybe at least, at least in, in large parts what I'm going to talk about. Um, Gerald Mahan published a paper in 96 where he actually look at, looked at the full figure of merit including the phonons and just figured out what would be basically by an optimization process, I will go into the physics a little bit more of this, but by basically optimizing this expression already figured out that the best possible way of getting um, a high, or the, the highest possible Z that you can get is based on the delta shaped um, density of states. I will explain this a bit more now, I just want to have said that the idea was out there before we even entered this picture. Yeah, so I will now introduce this picture. This is basically what I will use for the, pretty much for the rest of the talk. So I want to introduce my language. So basically from now on I will be talking about a system where we consider having two Fermi Dirac distributions of electrons, a hot one and a cold one. And I have something in the middle, this something is the thing that I'm interested in. What kind of energy filter it turns out, what kind of thing do you want to put in the middle here to get the best possible thermoelectric performance out. And then the key thing is I'm considering, the, the interesting case is the one where the chemical potential on the cold side, the electric chemical potential is higher than on the hot side, meaning that if you get a current to flow from hot to cold, you will do work. You will be working, for instance, charging a battery. So this voltage here that creates this difference in electrochemical potential could be that of the battery that you're charging. So I want to get hot electrons to flow over there powered by the thermal, thermal difference. How do we do that? And very, very briefly, so these are the elements that I just mentioned. And then we have this energy filter in the middle. And just to set this up just, just a little bit more, the we... In, in, in my personal history, I entered this field because I literally, we were confronted with this picture for, from some other project and just tried to understand, is it actually possible to do this at Carnot efficiency? So can you set up such a system with some kind of optimized filter? So Mayhan's delta function will be the answer in the end, such that you actually can do this process electronically at Carnot efficiency. And the, the answer is not, it doesn't look promising to start with if you come from sort of textbook thermodynamics where we of course in classical thermodynamics are used to these cyclical heat engine processes where for example the Carnot cycle means you have some kind of working gas, some ideal gas that goes through a prescribed cycle of heating up and expansion and so on. But where you make sure that the working gas is only ever in either in contact with your hot reservoir where the heat comes from or with the cold reservoir where you dump the heat. You would never do such a crazy thing as putting the working gas in touch with both at the same time because of course the ideal gas atoms would just shuttle back and forth and short circuit the whole thing. And that's exactly what thermoelectrics is trying to do. So this is why we have this denominator here. So to start with this looks like a hopeless enterprise. How can you hope to make this thing from Carnot efficient if you know that, that this will never work. So, um, so the, the, re the way we looked at this was that we basically said well we have our system here, a hot bath, a cold bath, <coughs> and ultimately what we want to do is we want to take electrons from the hot bath, but dump them into the cold bath in such a way that the entropy of the system doesn't change. That's what Carnot efficient means. You do something without producing entropy. You do it reversibly. So you can set up how this works. So if you imagine you take an electron up here, it has a certain kinetic energy. It turns out the, the heat, the delta Q, so the delta the entropy is Q over T. So the heat is the electron's energy relative to the chemical potential. So this is this bit divided by the temperature in your bath. So if I take this electron out of the right-hand bath, I remove this much entropy from the right-hand bath and put this much entropy into the left-hand bath. You can work this out. And then you find for all normal processes you generate entropy as you, as you move. For example, <coughs> if we put the simplest possible energy filter here, we block 
cold electrons, let hot electrons go over there, then you get a thermal voltage, that's the Seebeck effect. So you have basically, by diffusion, you have more electrons up here, they move over there, that generates a voltage, and you generate this much entropy. So this is, this is what you expect. The other simple case is where you imagine you don't have a temperature difference, but you have a voltage difference. So this is the normal, let's run a current through a material. And then, so the, the temperature is the same on both sides, but the energy is different. So you take an electron with little kinetic energy and move it to an area with a lower chemical potential where it has more kinetic energy, which of course ultimately gets dissipated. And you simply can see this entropy goes up as you expect and you actually get so basically your Ohm law, Ohm's law back or can work out that the power that you produce is directly related to the entropy you generate. So this is all straightforward. It's just to set up a language. And now the interesting case is when you have both. So you have your temperature difference one way, the voltage difference the other way. We do the math and then it turns out you can actually find an energy, one energy, where this entropy production actually is zero. That's the one we've been looking for. So there's a specific energy that I have marked here with the green arrows, where you actually can take an electron from the hot bath and put it at the same energy into the cold bath or vice versa, and the entropy of the system doesn't change. So it's this energy here. Intuitively, it becomes clear what's going on if you realize that this expression also describes the point where the two Fermi-Dirac distributions cross. So there's a Fermi-Dirac distribution here, there's one here. At some energy, they have the same value. And at that energy, the occupancy is the same on both sides. There is no net flow of charge or heat or anything. The electron sort of can move back and forth, but it doesn't do anything to the system. So in that limit, if you, if you at this energy move one electron from one side to the other, you are operating at Carnot engine, at Carnot efficiency, but it also means you're not doing anything, which is the same, which is generally true for all Carnot engines. Carnot engines don't do anything. They are a very useful limit to understand because it tells you where your irreversibilities are and non-perfections, but you don't want to be there to operate to, to, to generate work. So this becomes clear here. This is sort of plotted, if you look at the full line here, this is the um, operation. You can either generate work or if you put your f this line too low, you will have flow of cold electrons to the hot side. So you will cool one side using power and the efficiency reaches one re relative to Carnot efficiency at this one specific point that I just described. This is for a delta function. The other bit is, of course, if you open up your window a little bit so that you get more flow, then some of your electrons will not be at the perfect energy anymore. They will produce work, but also dissipate energy. So then your efficiency goes down and your power goes up. So you can play with this. So I go, I, the, the if maximum power thing I get into much more in a moment. But this means that for such a system, if you can control your energy, then you can actually set up a uh, a heat engine such that el electronically it, it operates at Carnot efficiency or very close to it. So this is, this is from my perspective, um, the, an introduction to quantum, um, to quantum dot heat engines. Um, now, I mentioned already that the Carnot limit itself is highly interesting fundamentally, totally uninteresting from a perspective of applications because it doesn't produce any power. A Carnot engine is one that doesn't do anything. It, you, you, the, the system that I just described is basically one in equilibrium. So it's a funny type of equilibrium because you actually have two different temperatures and voltages, but by connecting at only one energy where the electrons don't care whether they are left or right, it behaves as if in equilibrium. So it doesn't do anything. Um, this was understood or, or sort of I mean, people understood this from before Carnot efficiency even was defined, but what you want power. But it took surprisingly long until the 70s, until somebody sort of described the maximum power limit in the same terms as the Carnot cycle had been described before, where the Curzon Alborn basically looked at the Carnot cycle from a sort of a traditional heat engine perspective and said, what would be the best possible efficiency you can achieve at maximum power. So if you set up your Carnot engine such that it operates at maximum power, what's the efficiency that you can get? That turns out to be an equally simple expression, which works out to be just above half of the Carnot efficiency. 
which is in a, under, certain, under certain limitations or under certain assumptions, but they are not so bad. So most power stations where you receive your electricity or heat from, they work very near to the Carson, Curzon Albon limit. Sometimes they have a set, second stage. They can even work a little bit higher by sort of cheating a little bit. But they, they, this is pretty much where they operate. Your car doesn't work there because you want to move even faster. So you optimize for more power than efficiency for most cars at least. Um, so this was looked at in, for the context of quantum dot heat engines first by Massima, Massimiliana Esposito and Katja Lindenberg and Chris van den Bröck who looked at this basically saying, let's assume we have a quantum dot that represents this one energy level here. And otherwise, it's sort of the language that I just used, a hot bath, a cold bath, a different in, therm in chemical potential. And they look at, it, at sort of what I would say a first order of, of maximum efficiency. So they still assume a delta function here which means you're not really at maximum power because the delta function only lets, lets through a certain amount of electrons. But then allow it to move around, not to the point of maximum efficiency, but to the point of maximum power. And in that limit of a delta function, you then reproduce the curzon albon limit very nicely. This is not really the maximum power limit because the real maximum power you get if you actually allow your this energy level here that could be a quantum dot for example to not be a delta function but to be broadened in one way or another and if we assume it to be symmetrically broadened which is not optimal so one can also play with the symmetry for example of this resonance here but for a symmetrically broadened resonance then one can play with that so this is the gamma describing the, the, the width of this resonance um, working out all the different power the, the, so basically playing with all the different operational points where you could, could operate your, your heat engine and then you get this nice envelope. So every operation point has a certain power and a certain efficiency. If you make your resonance very sharp, that's the limit down here that you can hardly see, that's the limit that S positive et al looked at, then indeed you can get at maximum power, you will get the curzon albon efficiency, about half, but the power stays very small because you have this very narrow resonance then you can open up your resonance, you can allow more flow at the cost of more dissipation, then you can get much higher power, but the maximum efficiency, efficiency at maximum power goes down. So this is, um, this is sort of expected, but gives a nice sort of map where you want to be. And it turns out with this, you, with this type of resonance, you want to have a resonance width of about 1 kT that gives you the maximum power. I'm not going to talk more about this, but one can play with the shape of these resonances if you make that asymmetric, which you get in 1D conductors, for example, or if you play with interference effects in molecules, then you can sort of tailor that and bring things up even higher. But that's a subject for a different talk. Now with this long introduction to this field, I would like to move to um, experimental realizations, which some of you who know me a bit longer know that I've been talking about this for even about the experimental realization, how did I dare to say it, but it's about 12 years. Um, but now we, we did it. <laughs> so today I can show data that I think are the, for now, final answer to this. So the system that we have been trying to realize to, to get close to this Carnot efficiency for some years now, is based on a, on a nanowire, nanowires in part because we have access to them, but they are in fact, I think, probably the ideal system to do this. So a nanowire has a one-dimensional geometry, means there's a well-defined hot side and cold side, if you wish, you can, you can put a temperature gradient across it. But then one can make heterostructures, one can put a double barrier here, so for example, indium arsenide has a small band gap, I will show band structures in a moment, indium phosphide has a big band gap, meaning you can, these, these slices here are tunneling barriers, so this is a double barrier forming a quantum dot, and you, have a, you get quantization effects in here, you also get Coulomb charging effects, which are the important ones actually, and this is a way of realizing such an energy filter. Just briefly how these nanowires are made, this is um, people in my environment who, who do this, we're just users of these, but the way this is done is that one does epitaxial growth like you would do in, in a planar geometry. 
but you work in a limit where the planar growth doesn't quite take place. And instead you have catalysts, so this is often gold particles, that help to sort of bring the reagents together and also change the, there's various uh, complicated phase diagram going on. But the upshot of it is that under conditions where planar growth not quite takes place, you can get growth at the interface between the, the gold particle and the substrate. So that the gold particle ends up sitting on top and being pushed up by the growth. So that stays there in the end. And then the really cool thing is you can change materials as you go along and, for example, make these heterostructures. And then you can do quantum dot experiments. So this is a, a basic setup. We break off one of these wires, put it on a flat substrate that on the one hand has an oxide, which is just electrically insulating. Underneath the oxide is, is highly conducting silicon, which we can use as a gate, meaning we will often put a voltage on, on the substrate and deplete the wire or pull in charge, charges so we can change the Fermi energy in the wire. That's very important for us. And then as a source and drain contact to measure conductance. And then we also need a thermal gradient, which in these early experiments we did by actually running a heat current through the ohmic contact that we use also for measuring. That turned out to be too complicated. Now we use sort of a sandwich design that I show, show you in a moment. But then you can run a current through this double barrier structure. And just very briefly, this, if, if you look at any talk or any paper about quantum dot transport through a quantum dot, you will see some kind of image like this, these um, stability diagrams. Basically, uh, graphing the conductance, so these diamonds show the magnitude of conductance. White means no conductance, light gray, some conductance, dark gray, more conductance as a function of two voltages, the bias voltage on the one hand and the gate voltage which pulls in and out charge carriers on the other axis. And just to sort of show you the interesting points here, so for example, there's areas where you get no, if we just start it with the gate voltage here, so no bias voltage and we move up and down the gate voltage, means we push the chemical potential relative to the states within the quantum dot. If it's cold, so we have no thermal smearing, and the chemical potential is between resonances in the quantum dot, then there's no conductance. It's a wide area. You can move along the gate voltage to get conductance. This would be a situation like this, where the chemical potentials line up with the resonance. Or you can get out of such a wide area by applying a bias voltage until your, your um, chemical potentials line up with other resonances. And then by doing this, one can map out where all the resonances are and so on. And this is what this can look like for a well-behaved quantum dot. They all don't always come like this. But if you have a well-behaved one and everything is nice, you can even deplete down until there is no conductance left. And then you know you have no, so down here there would be no conductance electron in a quantum dot. And then you have the first resonance when you add one electron and the next electron and so on. So you can very nicely understand what's going on there. And then if you measure thermal voltage, and again, if everything is well behaved, you can get data like this, where this is now applying a temperature difference. Blue means small temperature difference, red means large temperature difference, difference, and tuning the gate voltage. And then for each time one of these resonances crosses your um, chemical potentials, you get one of these double resonances where you first see a negative thermal voltage or thermal current, depending on what you do, and then a positive one. And that corresponds to either holes traveling through your resonance or electrons. So you have this unique situation where you get a positive or negative Seebeck coefficient in the same material. Normally it's related to doping. A p-type conductor will have positive, an n-type conductor will have negative. The quantum dot can sort of do both. And then you know exactly your resonances line up with, with these um, double resonances for the thermal voltage. Now, we, with, with sort of just heating the contacts, we got to a degree, we got very nice data and so on, but we never were able to get proper quantitative agreement between theory and experiment to the degree that you can credibly prove Carnot efficiency. So we got within a factor of two or so, um, not worse or better than anybody else in the field, but it wasn't good enough. So, uh, one of the breakthroughs experimentally was when a student, Jan Glushke, in my group developed the technology for, 
for a heater technique that does two, th so that separates the heater electrically from the electric measurements. So we have one layer of contacts that are the, the electric measurement, then a oxide layer, and then on top we put electrically isolated the heater. So the, the electrical separation was important, but at the same time the phys physical vicinity to put the, to put the heaters directly on top of the contact was important because that allows us to apply temperature gradients without heating too much overall. What people had done so far was, so they, you have a substrate, you have a wire here somewhere, and then you would put a big heater over there, sort of heating up generally everything. And that works, it gives you a certain amount of gradient across the wire, but at the cost of heating up the whole cryostat. And that's fine if you want to work at 50 Kelvin or something, but if you want to work at 1 Kelvin, you cannot afford to heat everything just because you want to apply a bit of gradient. So with this system now we got excellent control. So this is, the, this is delta T as a function of power at room temperature measured. So the hot side goes up massively while the cold side hardly heats. And this actually gets even better at lower temperatures. So we, we, um, yeah, we, we got the control that we wanted. And that, together with a number of maybe less dramatic tweaks, then allowed us to do an experiment that was run by Artis Svilans in the last two years or so. Um, still the same system, same old indium arsenide, indium phosphide structures, but we look for, them for a nice quantum dot. But now with these heating contacts right on top of the electrical contacts, but electrically insulated. So this is the setup. I don't think I need to say much more about that. But then the key thing was not only to have an excellent experimental student doing this, but him working together with an equally excellent theory student, Martin Josefsson, who really worked hand in hand on this, with Martin being in the lab and Artis being on the computer and analyzing as they went. So just to walk you through what's going on here. So on the one hand, this is one of the stability diagrams, which basically, if you know how to look at them, tells you this is a nice quantum dot, a very well-defined resonance here. You know exactly where your resonance is. So this is the one that we are working with. These are fits to the conductance as a function of gate voltage at a couple of different temperatures, which allows us to extract the tunnel coupling. So how strongly does this the state inside the dot coupled to the reservoirs, which we need as fit parameters. So they are extracted from these fits. We extract tunneling couplings, which we then use for all the rest of the analysis. So this is the only fitting that's going on, really. And the quality of these fits is excellent, which is because the theory that Martin uses goes to, to higher order tunneling and so on. So it really is a, is a, is a state of the art theory, very, very reproducing everything. So well that we from these thermo, if we now measure the thermo current as a function of gate voltage across this resonance, he can from fitting these using the tunnel couplings that we have determined from fitting the thermo currents, he can even extract the temperature on the hot side and the cold side, which is plotted here. So this is a, a pure thermometry graph extracting the hot temperature and the cold temperature as a function of heating. And then with that in hand, we can both measure and predict the power output that we should get. So this is now the thermocurrent, but plotted as a power, so current times voltage. The, the dots are data points, the lines are the predicted power output based on the parameters that we have determined. So the tunnel coupling and the temperature. So there's no, this is not a fit anymore, this is based on the previous fits with a set of parameters that we use for this dot. Um, so we measure the power output, we get very nice agreement with the prediction from the theory. We cannot measure the heat flow. So this is, a, this is an, ex an extremely difficult task to measure the electronic heat flow. It has been done in certain contexts, but never with also a bias voltage on and measuring current at the same time and so on. So we have to calculate the heat flow. So this is the flaw in this whole thing still, but we are confident that the Theory, so this is the calculated heat flow based on the calculated and measured power. Since we can reproduce the power so nicely, we believe that the heat flow probably is also okay. So, but this is what we do. So we measure the power, we calculate the heat flow. And then we can do these loopy graphs that I showed you before as well. So basically each of these scattered data points here is a power measurement. And with the theory heat flow, we can also determine an efficiency. 
So on a graph with efficiency here and power there, each of these data points over there shows up somewhere over here. And then you see on the rising slope here, where the power is well defined, also the, this loopy graph is very well defined. On the way down, so this would be these data points. Actually too far. So these data points here, where both the power and the heat flow become very small, their ratio, of course, also becomes very scattered. So this is sort of this mess going on here. So therefore, we decided we cannot really extract from single graphs like this anything about the maximum efficiency. But we think that the maximum power points are quite well defined. So these points, we think one can believably extract from these data points. So this is basically based on these data points here. They show up over there. So the system in the, in the area of maximum power production, we think we can analyze um, consistently. What is different with these different loopy graphs is different load resistances. So the dot works against different load. So basically, we do some impedance matching here. And then if we put all for all the different loads, we make new loopy graphs. So this is now the quantum dot operated at maximum power for different loads, where you basically start with low load and go to high load as you go around for two different delta t's. <clears throat> These are now well-defined data points. And from that, we can look at where is the efficiency at maximum power, which lines up almost exactly with the curzon albon prediction. And then on the way down, where we increase the efficiency at the cost of decreasing power, we move into the area of about 70% of Carnot efficiency at still finite power output. So this, is, this was the best we thought we can do, and we submitted this, and it's still under review at the moment. Um, yeah. So that's the, yeah, please. Is this for a single peak or a bit analyzed? different conductance peaks? Uh, all of these data are for one peak, but we did it for a number of different quantum dots. And, and you know, data always have their flaws, but overall it's the same picture. Yeah. But even for the same dot, you can just tune to get what is different peaks. Yeah, I don't think we have done that, actually. I think we always went for the best resonance, but in different devices. I, um, I mean, you want one, you want to use a resonance that overall doesn't show any funny stuff. Quantum dots can look all sorts of features, right? We want one that is well reproduced by, by our theory. Uh, um, depends what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so we have also looked at things like Kondo and so on. So if you, but, but in, this, in this picture, we just wanted to have the cleanest possible resonance, yeah. Yeah, can you access the video with you? Uh, we, we probably do that. We haven't tried because we, well, actually, we could do that. We don't measure heat flow directly. We could potentially see some cooling, yeah. yeah. I just have to remind you that in my whole analysis, I'm ignoring the phonons. Um, so they, of course, still limit that, how, how much cooling you can get. But we could probably, yeah. There should be a difference, yeah. Okay, with the last minutes, I guess, uh, yeah, I have 10 or 15 minutes, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me jump topic entirely, seemingly at least, and in, in just a few slides you will see it's the same thing. <laughs> but, but for now we take a big step and we look at solar cells instead of thermoelectrics. So the, the, the next slide is, or the next couple of slides give you a brief reminder how solar cells work. Um, this is sort of a band diagram of a commercial silicon-based solar cell run at short circuit, meaning you have sort of a flat band configuration. So a solar cell is based on a PN junction, so P and N. But in general, you don't have just a PN junction. You have a PIN junction because you need some region, some bulky region, where you can actually absorb light. So this is your light absorption area. So that needs to be large enough that you catch the light and small enough that you can still catch the carrier. So this is some kind of optimization that's going on there. And then what people do is they shine light on it. The photon gets hopefully absorbed in this region, generates an electron-hole pair. The electron and hole diffuses around in this flat region. Um, but soon or later, the electron will realize it cannot climb up here, frustrate the diffuses a bit more until it falls down there, and vice versa, the hole. 
In textbooks, you often see this picture where they skip the eye region and tell you it's the electric field in the depletion region that rips the electron hole apart, which is true, of course, but you don't need that. All you need to make sure is that somehow the electron ends up left and the hole ends up right. So some, some kind of selective contact of some, some kind or another is fine. So you don't need that electric field. Um, a limitation of the efficiency of single junction solar cells. So this is the vast majority of solar cells that you, except for extremely exceptional applications, it's always single, single junction solar cells. You have an optimization thing to do. You have to choo choose your band gap. Which band gap should you use for your conductor? And based on the solar spectrum, you are facing a number of different losses here. So this is the power that you can get out from a single junction solar cell. The problem is that your band gap gives you a cutoff, a lower energy cutoff for the photons that you can um, use at the same time. So that means you would want to use a small band gap, right, so that you catch as many photons as possible. On the other hand, if you, if you use a small band gap, then most of your photons will have a situation like this, where they generate electron hole pairs with quite a bit of kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy gets lost. By the time the electron hole pair gets separated, they have long ago thermalized. There's no mechanism built in here that would allow you to catch that energy. So a small band gap means you lose, sorry, a, a large band gap means you lose most photons because they simply don't even create electron hole pairs. A small one means you lose most energy to heat and the optimum is around 1.3 or so for the solar spectrum. So that's where silicon, and then you look for cheap materials and you end up with silicon or if you want to spend a bit more with gallium arsenide, which is a little bit more optimal. So this is sort of the, the, what you face. There is one way around this that works very well, which is used to use multi-junction solar cells that sandwich multiple band gaps and then can get very close to ideal efficiencies, but also very expensive. So in a single junction solar cell, you face this, this scenario. Um, the, the one way around this war has been identified some time ago namely to look at the non-equilibrium energy of the electrons. So let me just show this slide here. In the, if you imagine you start with some kind of equilibrium semiconductor, and now we imagine a pulse of light comes in with a certain photon energy, you will create non-equilibrium holes, non-equilibrium electrons, which then relax in two steps. The first one is to form an actual temperature distribution, like a Fermi-Dirac distribution, in the electron hole gas, but at a temperature much higher than the lattice. And then in the second step, you cool to the lattice temperature. The normal solar cells work over here. The question is, what if we could work over here, where you can still use somehow that heat in the electrons or hose? And <clears throat> again, we sort of approached this system from in our group from, from one end, and we looked at this fantasy band structure, which like, like this would be very hard, if at all possible, to realize, but it's just for us to think about. So the, the idea is let's set up a system to think about that contains an absorber material where you can create electron hole pairs. And what a solar cell does is the way one describes a solar cell is you create a non-equilibrium density of electrons, which is described by a quasi-Fermi level for electrons and a corresponding non-equilibrium density of holes, which is described by a Fermi level for holes. And it's that Fermi level splitting that gives you the best possible voltage of a solar cell. So this is what a solar cell uses, is this bit. Now, in addition to that, at least in some, under some limits, where you do it sufficiently fast or whatever it takes, your electrons could actually be hot because of this extra kinetic energy, and your holes could be hot. So in principle, one could imagine a situation where you set up, and this is why I put a double barrier here, you understand why, where you set up a thermoelectric system for the electrons and one for the holes and try to catch that extra energy in addition to the quasi fermi level splitting that a solar cell uses. And the first question we asked us, is this actually possible? This looks like an overdetermined system. I already explained that this system has very specific requirements and then you have the holes, and then there's the quasi-Fermi level splitting. Can this actually be done? So we wrote, we put down this model where we sort of try to come up with the minimum amount of parameters that you can sort of describe this with. 
where we say in some kind of steady state situation we have some warm electrons and holes, we have cold holes and electrons, this quasi fermi level splitting. We imagine we can put energy filters in specific positions that we can move around and we're looking can this be optimized in terms of entropy. So the idea is basically imagine you now send in one more photon creating one more electron hole pair, get, try to get the electron out here in an optimal way, get the hole out there in an optimal way and look at the entropy of the whole system, can this be done? It, so the, it's basically the same calculation as before, just with four terms now. One for the electron being removed, electron added, hole removed, hole added. So this gives these four terms. And it turns out, yes, again, it is possible to write down an equation when the entropy change in the system will be zero, even though you have this delta mu going on. It's actually a very simple expression. So fundamentally, this is possible. One can, in principle, set up a hot carrier solar cell type system with a thermodynamically optimum, for example, quantum dot heat engine for the electrons and one for the holes. And then the hallmark is what voltage can you get out. Um, in a normal solar cell, you find this expression, meaning this, the voltage you can get from a solar cell is the quasi fermi level splitting minus whatever entropy production you have in your extraction process, any dissipation that's going on there. And now you get an additional term of the heat engine running on top of there. So this, is, this tells you this is possible, at least in, in, in principle. Um, and now we are sort of working on experiments with nanowires where we try to play with this. This particular experiment we haven't done in this controlled form at least, but this gives you the idea. So we want to use a nanowire. We want to focus our light absorption into an area next to an energy filter, which could be something fancy like here, or it could just be an energy barrier, and then try to get this, this extra electron energy out of there. It needs to be done fast before the electrons cool, but tunneling is fast. So the, the time scales are in, in our favor, at least fundamentally. So basically, we want to somehow control where light gets absorbed, an energy filter, and then what we do at the moment is in, in the systems that we're using indium arsenide, the holes are quite heavy compared to the electrons. They get very little of the kinetic energy, so we just ignore them. We just play with the electrons for now. But in principle, one could do both. And nanowires are a cool system for this on the one hand because they have known photonic effects. That means one has tools to describe how light is absorbed in nanowires. One knows that there's maxima and minima. One can play with this. Where, where, we get, where do we get light absorption? Um, the technology for making nanowire solar cells exists. So it's, not, it's like, so with PN junction nanowires, one can make efficient solar cells. Uh, again, because of photonic effects, because the nanowires work as an array to catch light. So they actually do this very efficiently. Um, and then, this is really important, there are data, existing data that tell us that the carrier temperature in nanowires under illumination can be quite high. It gets higher for thinner nanowires, presumably because of um, the, the phonon spectrum as well as the electron spectrum get quantized and it gets harder and harder for the electrons to get rid of, your, of their heat in a, in a allowed way that they find the right states. Presumably, this is not really understood. So I can just briefly show you what we have done. Um, so we have done a device where we aimed for this process, so an energy barrier, absorb light on one side, and then see an open circuit voltage building up due to this filtering effect. In our first experiments, we did this fairly uncontrolled. So we basically hoped for the best, put down a, a barrier between two contacts, and then said when we shine light on this, presumably the light absorption will be stronger on one side than the other side. Turns out if you model this, you actually expect the differences for different wavelengths. So for example, in this region here, for one wavelength, you expect photonic effects to work out such that the light absorption is mostly on one side of the barrier for a different wavelength, mostly on the other side of the barrier, which would then predict a sign change of the thermal voltage as well. And this is actually what we see. So these are IV curves where the black line is in the dark. There's just no current because there's a barrier. Under illumination, we can get power production either positive or negative of different colors. So this is an 
uncontrolled shifting around of the photon absorption spot, which we don't have control over in these experiments. But we get voltage out. And excitingly, that voltage is actually quite high. So even in this first experiment, in our best conditions, we get IV curves that indicate an open circuit voltage that's actually higher than the schottky quiser limit predicts for a single junction solar cell for that material, which is exactly what we saw before. So in this case, it's 95% of the band gap. You couldn't possibly hope to get there with a solar cell normally. Um, we describe this at the moment as a purely thermionic effect. So we don't even, I mean, we call it a hot carrier solar cell, I guess, but we don't even think of the Fermi level splitting too much because just assuming that we have a temperature difference across a barrier would explain our results if that carrier temperature difference is about 170 Kelvin, which is in line with what people have seen in PL measurements. But now the key thing that I want you to sort of understand is I told you in the beginning that, well, that I will ignore phonons in my analysis for the quantum dot heat engine, where we were kind of cheating because there are phonons. Here we are talking about non-equilibrium carriers. So to the degree that the carriers actually are hot, they are not talking to the photons. So we really look only at a carrier temperature difference where phonon heat leaks for that temperature difference actually is not an issue. So it is actually okay, and our high efficiency results actually apply to this system. So this is where I think it becomes exciting that we actually have, a, we have proven now that we can convert heat into electricity at high efficiency, and there's a system where this actually applies to, so these hot carrier systems. We are working on this, so um, for example, we are trying to control where exactly we get this hot spot. So there's a plasmonic element placed right next to a barrier to try to see whether we can show that we get electricity right out of that spot. And we think we can show that because we get a very clear difference depending on wavelength. If we excite above the barrier, we get a linear dependence with power, which you expect for ballistic extraction. If we excite below the barrier, we just work with the tail of the Fermi function, we get a different behavior. So I think we, we think we can show that. And with that, I think I want to end and just say we are happy that we got our high efficiency out of the quantum dots. We are playing with, um, with hot carrier solar cells and think that there's nothing that should stop us fundamentally of doing similar things with hot carriers. There's many, many practical issues. You can talk to me and I can give you lists of them, but it's not, nothing fundamental as far as we can tell. And NanoWire is actually not a bad candidate to do this because we because they're actually quite suited with the one-dimensional geometry and we know photonics are pretty well understood. So there's many things that, that make sense with nanowires for carrier solar cells, so we'll keep working on that. And we already got a high VOC out of the first experiment actually, so pretty good. Okay. And sorry, I want to of course highlight who did all of this work. In particular, for the last few results, I already highlighted Steve Limpert brought me to hot carrier solar cells, did all the theory that I showed. Artis and Martin were a dream team on realizing this experiment, and Yu Chen has been working on these latest results to try and control the hotspot of um, light absorption. Thank you very much.